Hi, uh, good afternoon and good morning to all of you. I'm Krishna Amar, President of uh, PMI Kerala Chapter. So seven societies joined together in conducting a series of webinars uh, during this uh, COVID scenario situation where uh, members of uh, members can update their knowledge accordingly and all the societies are getting benefited out of it. We have experts from all the parts of the world and uh, who is sharing the knowledge. And uh, this, we have already conducted a series of sessions which are very much knowledge packed. And uh, today is uh, another Wednesday with uh, a great knowledge which is going to happen. And the key societies who are collaborating is IEEE Kerala Session, uh, Institution of Engineers, Kerala State Center, Internet Society of India, Kerala Chapter, uh, Computer Society of India, Trivandrum Chapter, Vikram Maulavi Foundation Trust, Trivandrum, IEEE Engineering and Medicine uh, and Biology Society, Kerala Chapter, and Project Management Institute from Kerala. For today, uh, we have more than 200 registrants from 15 countries across the world. And uh, this is a very, because of the very unique um, presenter we have and who is having a lot of knowledge. So uh, today the session will be handled by John Samuel from Institute of uh, Sustainable Development and Governance uh, on technology and economy in the post COVID era. Uh, to start the session, uh, I would like to invite, uh, yes, Dada Krishnan of IE. Uh, to start the welcome address. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krishna Kumar. I am Radha Krishnan, past chairman, IA Kerala State Center. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, past chairman, Kerala State Center. Let me first thank the organizing committee chairman, Mr. Harinder Lal, for, for giving me an opportunity and also taking the pain to arrange this, such a webinar talk every Wednesday without fail, especially this during COVID era. And it is, it is being appreciated by all the professionals across the world. As you all are aware, this is the ninth talk arranged by the six societies based in Trivandrum, six professional societies. Today we have 214 members across 15 countries, which shows the enthusiasm shown by the professionals to attend this webinar talk arranged by the six professional societies. Today's speaker is John Samuel, who is well known nationally and internationally, and he's a very good speaker, I was told. On behalf of the Inter Society, let me welcome you, sir, for this talk, and also all the members who are registered in this Inter Society webinar talk on technology and economy <clears throat> on the, the post COVID era. Thank you. Now, let me request Dr. Damodaran, sir, to introduce the speaker to the viewers. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So this is uh, VKD. Uh, it's a very pleasant task to introduce John Samuel uh, in a simple way. If you want to introduce him, you should say he, he has been a social entrepreneur and a civic leader for the past 25 years and above. Of course, he's the president of the, the Institution of uh, Sustainable Development and Governance. As a professional, he has vast experience in policy platforms and governance. He has also a long career establishing centers in various parts of India and in the world, uh, also associated with UN for a long time, especially UNDP. He was actually in the beginning, I think he was the founder, CEO of National Center for Advocacy Studies, Pune. And uh, he was also CEO of Forum Asia, uh, which actually uh, raised a lot of discussions and a lot of activities in connection with protection of human rights and connecting it with development. He was also uh, the director of the UNDP Global Program on Governance Assessment. This is actually a rare speciality where we have the opportunity to assess the governance indices or what you call the governance characteristics or the nature 
of several countries developed as well as developing and i think he has also done in uh, for various states in india also over the years and uh, and he is a man who does not actually uh, try to mince words he is a very powerful orator and uh, he has always his logic his points uh, with him and he establishes what he really wants to speak about and also what he has arrived out of his research and uh, i would say that uh, he has also worked as consultant advisor to various un agencies not only undp uh, and on various other international or agencies uh, and he had uh, at the time i think two international offices one in europe and one in one of the developing countries and he was always been shuttling between countries and all that now luckily we have him around here in kerala uh, lives close to uh, adur where uh, he is actually running a very unique center called bodhigram which i had also occasion once or twice to be there and see how even the very elderly people are actually taken well uh, through the encouraging discussions with them and uh, meeting in the evenings and all that kind of thing so it's a very kind a lot of things he does and uh, i think in today's talk we have a lot to learn from his global experience and uh, without standing in between his speech and uh, you are patient uh, waiting i would rather request uh, dr john samuel to uh, present his topic of today welcome thank you very much thank you very much uh, professor bk damodaran thank you very much institute of uh, engineers wakamolu foundations and all uh friends and colleagues in different parts of uh, kerala and the world today i would uh, uh make my presentation in three parts the first aspect i would talk about uh, technology and what's the implications of technology um at various levels the secondly i will talk about some of the economic consequences which has also connections with technology and later on i would say what are the implications for the poor and marginalized that's uh, that's one of my area of uh, uh, you know persistent interest you know, one of the first thing to notice is uh, always the mode of technology influence the mode of communications and mode of communications influence our mode of thinking and action the second point i wanted to uh, say in terms of prologue is at the time of when you know we are pushed by a crisis there have been very surprising technological advances in the world this covid uh, lockdown as well as uh, covid challenge to humanity is in many ways unprecedented and proceeded in the sense we have had number of pandemics in the history of the world we have faced uh, you know what is wrongly termed as spanish flu or the into the flu before 100 years but all of them spread over a period of time uh, across the world but this is for the first time covid spread so fast and ironically because of technology you know uh, we are living in a world where we are more interconnected than ever more it is a globalized world uh, not only really in terms of interconnectivity and information flow as well as the perspectives but also people travel very very frequently it's very interesting that the first covid case was in kerala and that straight away came from the epicenter from wuhan now you know in india it's because that's a very interesting thing from because people from kerala go all over the world now once 
the situation is uh, has also uh, made more complicated by the lockdown. Literally, almost all over the world, a full lock lockdown or partial lock lockdown has affected uh, human lives, affected the way we use technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wanted to, uh, you know, pick up three or four aspects of this. The first thing is during SARS was the time there was a big technology leap in terms of business to business uh, te uh, technological development and also in terms of what we now known as platform economy where you know people could buy online things etc etc now in terms of human lives in most of the part of the world uh, the platform economy or some people say gig economy has tremendously influenced our choices in the way people buy things even in Trivandrum in cities you know most of the people it's not only really uber or you know uh, grab or anything it's also zomato and all other online platform which has actually made a big big difference uh, for many people to buy things you know in delhi two days when it was stopped it really affected but we also have to see that this is the reality of metropolitan cities. This is the reality of uh, countries where there's very big connectivity and also the business equipped to uh, deliver online. This online business also nowadays, there is a big innovations happening in terms of robotics uh, because of the pandemic. The second aspect, so this is a big area, actually, uh, globally, uh, while big platform like Amazon, uh, e-commerce, etc. got affected because the courier service got affected, supply chains got affected. But at the same time, local business, local apps has tremendously grown. Actually, many, many small actors have developed their uh, applications to access uh, goods and services in a very fast way so that's the first thing second aspect is very interestingly now zooming has become a verb you know which is very very well known this kind of platform which is you know online communication platform has grown so tremendously now with so many options available um, to offices uh, for conferences etc and that has changed the way we work. And that's a major, uh, you know, implications in terms of work-life balance, in terms of people work from home. Uh, it has very serious implications. The good thing about it is there are now many more technological options opened, uh, many more, uh, you know, VPN options opened. So this helped companies and, and actually many many more people have learned uh, video conferencing facilities now look at the way we talk this is an innovation and uh, in the old time uh, people from Trivandrum all over Trivandrum would have met in uh, you know Institute of Engineers Hall now there are people from 20 countries can participate in this meeting this is a great uh, you know uh, discovery and innovations sitting here in a very rather remote village with less connectivity i'm connected globally literally on a, a on a daily basis talking to people across the world we all of a sudden discovered that we don't need to travel and spend so much of uh, you know uh, uh, or result uh, so much of carbon footprinting without that we can have at least in the last three months i must have had six board meeting happening uh, international board meeting tomorrow i have the board meeting of asia democracy network and this is very interesting because we also learn you know in terms of technology taught us to be very precise uh, for the first time i personally discovered the board meeting which we spend uh, two days and a lot of money on the travel 
both flights as well as other staff, hotel. We finished within two hours because everyone uh, chose to be very precise. They have other meetings. So this is uh, this change of behavior. This is uh, uh, not only zooming technology. The conferences completely change the way we talk, the way we behave. This is a major transformation in terms of our behavior. This also the uh, change for good or bad. Uh, working from home. Working from the home, on the one hand, helped many people to uh, use their time more wisely because in many places, people spent, um, you know, I used to be in Bangkok till December. Many of my colleagues used to spend one and a half to two hours on the road to reach office. Now that time is free for them. Uh, to do many things. Many of them do, uh, you know, farming and, you know, spare times are available. But also it put a lot of stress on women, you know, in a house where there is online education, there is online work, the women's work has increased in a traditional family home. And also uh, what happens is uh, in the absence of socialization, working alone also created mental pressure. So technology has its both how technology behavior aspects uh, matters a lot. Now, the you know, all over the world, all over the world in 196 countries, all the uh, education uh, was suspended somewhere by March. Universities were closed, schools were closed, and then all of a sudden, online education. Online education is not new. Uh, there was already MOOC, uh, massive, you know, online open classrooms. The MOOC, uh, the MOOC options were always um, used by a number of universities. Online education in terms of research, uh, you know, libraries, digital libraries, etc., were very uh, common. But what happened is school education, online education was relatively less. Now the new normal has become online education. But this online education uh, creates a number of new platforms. And this technology also helped so many people to uh, you know, adapt and adopt. Especially, I know teachers who begin to uh, much, uh, you know, whose learning curve on technology has increased tremendously. I know somebody whose job is to teach other teachers on how to use different technology. But this has a very, very important aspect. What is known as digital divide is not a digital divide. It is a deep economic divide and economic exclusion and social exclusion. People do not have, you know, connectivity because they cannot afford to have connectivity. People do not have smartphone because people cannot afford to have it. So sometimes what happens is we, we begin to see uh, the upper middle class, middle class, in cities with a good uh, connectivity and broadband and number of devices, uh, you know, online education is a new excitement. It's a new normal. Somebody is in Idiki. I know many people in different parts of India and Kerala whose monthly income is not more than 10,000 rupees or 12,000 rupees. And they have three or four children to have access to these devices and connectivity. It's a big challenge. So one of the major interesting thing is while in metropolitan cities, and that is one of the things that technology unites, but also technology divides. But technology divides is not a technological divide alone. So many people say that you know we will uh, you know distribute uh, smartphone or television, and that will solve the problem. That will not solve the problem because one of the things what COVID has exposed the COVID rupture is the inequalities we put under the carpet, you know, social and economic inequality and exclusion, we put on the carpet, all of a sudden got, got uh, you know, exposed. And that is what we are seeing today. So in a sense, online education is the third area of education. I mean, uh, the technological innovations. And it's a great and important thing and this innovation is very important in the future and there's no going back. But however, we need to see that how technology unites and how technology divides. 
and the technological divide is a function of social and economic exclusion, particularly in a country like India, where more people have become poor. The fourth aspect of uh, disease is uh, the good thing. Uh, there is a big gem in many countries. You know, the, the whole issue of technology and health. The telehealth has become a very important thing in the pandemic thing. It has its good and bad thing. In many parts of Europe and America, when people who are affected by COVID, they just get, you know, teleconsultation that helps. And uh, it assumes that you have a very good uh, connectivity, etc. That helped. And in this particular thing, the, you know, the application of uh, technology in health has very interesting thing. For example, COVID testing technology has, you know, expanded very fast. Even our own uh, Sri Chitra developed new innovation, innovative ways of much affordable ways of doing it. In um, India now, there are many startups starting, you know, uh, the mask, which is very, you know, surgical mask, as well as other protective equipments. So there are lots of, especially in the area of health, uh, there are lots of, and the most, uh, the positive and negative thing is, the monitoring aspect technology has, uh, surveillance and monitoring aspect technology has played a very important role. Countries like uh, uh, South Korea and others have used surveillance technology in a big way. The big worry about it is, uh, more than ever, the state has acquired a sort of legitimacy and the governments across the world are using this pandemic lockdown to do things the way they want to do it. So this surveillance health surveillance technology, especially using mobile phone and, you know, tracking devices, can later constrain your own freedom. So this is something which is a consequence of how uh, surveillance technology can play an enabling role, but also it can play a very, very uh, disruptive and, and difficult role, constraining the freedom and privacy of the people in the years to come. So that implications of surveillance, actually we are living in a world of surveillance capitalism. Surveillance has become from, in the last 20 years, especially from 9-11 onwards, we are used to uh, a world with surveillance. Today, the smartphone we carry actually track us. Everywhere, you know, we are under surveillance. And these tracking devices also could be, you know, innovation in technology. Uh, in places like China, already it is being used. So that could uh, play a very, very a different role. So in terms of, you know, health, it is positive, but also the surveillance technology can can really, really uh, play a very, very uh, disruptive role in terms of, um, uh, you know, communications. And then, you know, I wanted to see one of the major issue is um, uh, after the telehealth, online entertainment has all of a sudden bloomed because the problem in a lockdown society is the mental health because we have changed the way we live. We have changed the way we, we communicate. We have changed the way we relate. Uh, and confining to a home, entertainment becomes very, very important. And, uh, you know, and this technology has also uh, grown. There are now many apps, number of, earlier we were all used to Netflix, but there are a number of yoga providers online, uh, you know, there are lots of other online connectivity which makes people happy. And one of the major other thing which is, which is, you know, uh, which has become very common is, uh, all the churches are now working online. This is a very, very interesting thing. Uh, even in Kerala, I could see so many churches uh, and uh, so God has come to your home uh, through a virtual world. This is very interesting, you know. 
Uh, it just changed the way we we uh, connect with, with the God and divinity. Uh, and actually, it has a very important theological implications because earlier people used to go to a church or temple to pre, uh, you know pray to the God. Now, the God and the preacher reaches out to you in your house and to connect. So it's a very, in, in, I mean, I'm not saying that it's entertaining. It is because many people, and this is very important, it's not entertaining, it is mental health. So religion play a very important role in terms of mental health, actually. And uh, especially at the time of, uh, you know, great mental stress and distress. So technology play a very, very important role in connecting. And because this is also a community, it's a virtual community, in connecting um, people with this community and uh, very important. Now, uh, one of the major thing is which is happening is the supply chain got disrupted. Especially, you know, COVID related, so many equipments we require. And the supply chain got, uh, you know, disrupted. And as a result, many innovation has happened. 3D printing has become uh, uh, in a sort of innovation used much more, uh, you know, uh, 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 prevalent in, largely in Europe, but other places also. 3D printing technology has been deployed to mitigate shocks of the supply chain and export bans in many places. You know, there are there are more export ban in many places. So 3D printing and the flexibility of the production helped many of those modern equipments to get it. And Nowadays, uh, one of the major uh, innovations which is happening already, which has been happening, is how robotics could be used in an innovative way, both for treatment as well as other stuff, uh, uh, including online platform. Now, in terms of one of the challenges which is happening is the more we live online in a virtual world, connectivity has become the most important challenge. Though, uh, you know, 5G information and communication technology is being introduced in the absence of real connectivity and technology, it's, it's sometimes it's a big challenge. It's, it's a challenge for me to connect from here. I have a BSNL uh, internet, which is, uh, you know, half functional, so not reliable. So data, even on a 4G data, you do not really get 4G effectively in villages or in, uh, in other places where you do not have better connectivity. So that also plays a very important challenge because we assume all this technological innovation on the basis of connectivity. So we are living in a world of paradoxes. On the one hand, it is the technology uh, of travel of human uh, travel across the world in such a, you know, a short time and actually literally everywhere that spread the pandemic within just two months across the world. And in a way that we have never received. Our technological preparedness was not, and this is also raised very, very important questions about the role of technology in our society. Because many countries, defense means the usual conventional war technology. And the war technology was developed uh, during every war. And today, the biggest business in the world is war technology and the health technology. Unfortunately, the countries who, you know, you look at every country, they spend more money to buy arms rather than, you know, uh, allocating money on public health. So when you have a public health emergency, your other conventional defense systems and technology become completely redundant. So, the, you know, look at all the countries which were mostly affected, including the United States. They have technology and drones for everything. They have the, you know, cutting edge technology. But unfortunately, that technology point, you know, proved to be futile. 
but at the same time you have the best hospital with the best technology but you didn't have a simple public health system that could track actually in kerala if you really look at it uh, it is the community monitoring which is at the panchayat level with the asha workers and the systems you know our governance system public health governance system really was much more active and effective than you track uh, using technology tracking people because at the community level in kerala that was one of the success stories in community level whether it is coordinated you know taking a pass is an ongoing technology but once you take the pass the asha worker comes to you, your house and check whether there is a home quarantine facilities this is what made kerala story which is very very different because and this is one of the thing which i said that how technology sometimes can complement the human action it is not necessarily a substitute for human action so it's very important to understand this and the paradox is some of the most technologically advanced countries who are at the cutting edge of health technology were at the cutting edge of um, you know defense technology could not really address a virus uh, coming in the way and it was taken for granted that we will handle it but then it disrupted every every thing now i will uh, quickly sum up um, saying that what are the economic implications the biggest paradox if you look at it kerala from where i speak and the gcc countries for the last 30 years from 1987 the economic growth of this state kerala was directly proportional to the remittances and the remittances largely came from the gulf because people in the us or europe mostly spend the money there for their survival and uh, equal monthly installment etc and because in the gulf countries there are restrictions for people to buy houses etc almost all the money came here now all of a sudden the economic disruption has and the lockdown resulted in the uh, very very decreasing or declining demand for oil this has disrupted the gulf economy in a big way oil prices uh, crashed and uh, you know all the countries are worried about their own economic uh, well being and this has resulted in a big way it it completely it's a rupture it has changed the economic conditions in such a way it has created uncertainty in gulf from the top to the bottom in so many ways and that is a direct implication on a remittance economy like kerala so in a way what is happening is you know one part of the world affect the other part of the world because and this is not necessarily a kerala issue entire south asia nepal bangladesh uh, look at philippines look at sri lanka these economies are very very you know badly hit around 200 million people as per the latest world bank report around 200 million people are expected to lose a job and this means also the aggregate demand will decrease though the world bank says in the in the latest report uh, they have uh, sort of pegged india's economic growth will come down to 3.5% my own sense is actually it is going to be negative in many countries the growth is going to be you know the, because there's a big public finance crisis and the public finance crisis is the shortfall even in 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 the state of kerala it is around 35000 shortfall of the expected revenue total if you re really like it it's more than a half a million lakh so that is going to be a big problem and only way in the short run is monetizing these deficit monetizing deficit means you know printing more money along with the lack of economic growth a possible inflation if we are not careful will create a stagflation so we are we are uh, moving into a situation 
of an economic recession of the scale which we have not seen in the last 80 years. And this, uh, this is going to affect in the short run the global trends. There will be a new protectionism everywhere. And look at even in India what's happening is, you know, in a place like metropolitan uh, place like Delhi, Delhi Chief Minister all of a sudden said their priority is Delhiites. And the definition of Delhiites will be very interesting. I don't know whether people have votes there or not. It has sent panic waves everywhere. When people do not, cannot trust the health system of the capital of India, you know, and people running for it. This is not only migrant workers, the middle class running around, uh, you know, seeking safety and seeking health care. So these economic consequences. And what really happened even in India, you know, without real preparation, without strategic thinking, without proactive planning, all of a sudden, like demonetization, you announce lockdown. Millions of migrant workers, all of a sudden it exposed the ugly fact of this country that largest number of poor people in the world lives in India. And among the people who cannot, you know, those who migrated to city due to the crisis in agriculture, due to the crisis in the job situation, and they were all in the labor camps constructing huge uh, apartments, huge buildings, roads and everything, all of a sudden, the, neither the government nor the system simply could not take care of them. And there were lots of poverty there. And, you know, it is, it is not an accident that a train killed 17 people and that didn't become a big news even in this country and that has not become a discussion point. So one of the major challenges, governments are worried about big business, governments are worried about the macroeconomy, but microeconomy is crashing and what's happening is their callousness and cynical approach to the poor has created a lot of problems. So it's not only really the poor who will become poorer. So, you know, the number of poor people in India, you look at it, around 490 million people do not have uh, access to, you know, they, do, they don't own land. So, you know, the amount of landless people who have been surviving on a monthly income between 7,000 to 12,000, with this lockdown, especially the small and um, medium scale, people who employ 10 people to 20 people to 5 people, there are 6 crore of them. And, you know, around 12 crore people are directly affected with this uh, pandemic. So we are in a situation where governments, you know, governments after government have, you know, given packages. But these packages have become rhetorical flourishes with some relief, but it's not going to change the situation. So we, we are living in a, pla a place where technology united us. Technology has created options for innovations, but paradoxically, it also divides the metropolitan cities and the villages. The distance increases, you know, both in terms of education and health and reporting. The technology also creates other troubles in terms of surveillance. So we need to, this is a point of transition. And this has, technology helped us in so many ways. And this also, hopefully, we'll have vaccine in a recorded time. However, this technology in itself has not addressed the issue of more than a billion people across the world who do not have access to technology, who do not have access to means of livelihood. Hence, there has to be a breakthrough way of looking at it. How do you ensure uh, new ways to reach out to people? How do you, uh, you know, take care of the relief work? And this is fundamental. This requires, and I will, uh, you know, stop with this thing. This requires a completely different way of thinking about democracy. Because more and more, Government get decent, uh, centralized, power get de uh, centralized, and people, when people cannot look up to civil society 
or the market for their protections, they look up to the, 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 the government, elected or non-elected government. But when government centralized, when, when government, you know, try to patronize, what happens is democracy itself and democratization of technology itself is an issue which needs to be uh, uh, considered. Hence, technology governance, technology, the democratization of technology and a new way of, uh, you know, thinking about the power uh, beyond government and governmental power. How do we, how, whether it which facilitate technology or uses technology for further control is something which we need to be worry about. So we, this is a time to be alert about it. Uh, while we can be optimistic that technology will find a solution, that has been history. But one also is deeply concerned about how technology can divide and technology can be used to control uh, freedom and you know and its implication for it for example you know including media has sort of blacked out number of arrests happen in india it is in effect it is a sort of undeclared emergency worse than that where all those people who have been locked out have been arrested and there has been hardly any discussions or debate or protests because it also it was the freedom of association freedom of assembly and freedom of expression. So we need to see this technology, the question is technology expand your freedom. You know, the expansion of freedom and cap capability is a very important thing. That is the milestone. Whether technology expands the freedom or constraints of freedom. Where technology unites more people and be inclusive or technology further exasperate the exclusion. These are some of the pointers we need to see the interlinkage between technology, economy, governance, and politics. Because towards the end of the day, technology is politics. Technology, those who have more technology or access to technology are more powerful. And that has been the history of the world. Hence, we need to be uh, alert. We need to think new ways of democratization of technology and power. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. Actually, because uh, this is a new thought-provoking session for us, many of us actually, at least to me, um, because uh, we never know, know that technology can actually divide us as well. Because till now we were actually thinking that technology can only unite us or make us closer. Now you have actually put a very different thought that uh, technology can divide us as well. So going to the the questions which are there at present. Uh, uh, the question by Shivadasan that uh, at present planning is based on the GDP growth. Do you, do you have to think a new paradigm for planning? Do you have any thoughts on that, sir? See, the, the major thing about uh, this GDP growth, the macroeconomic growth without distribution, I, I would say now there are new concepts coming in. The idea of well being. GDP growth, along with, I think there has to be a new paradigm on distributive mechanisms of GDP. So the GDP growth uh, story has helped a section of the middle class to become upper middle class. The tertiary educated, technologically educated, professional class move to a, their income has increased. But this GDP growth methodology didn't actually, and they, they, they have been relief measures, social protection. It has not changed the conditions of most of the poor people. So while there is an argument saying that GDP growth, you know, the uh, trickle down theory, GDP growth would decrease poverty. And it's a very well known uh, discussion in the World Bank. Even the World Bank changed their perspective. Uh, perspective. So GDP growth as a measure of economic growth is an erroneous concept. The participation, distribution, and well-being is a very, very important part. To that extent, I would say Kerala story is an interesting story with, the, with all its paradoxes. 
Kerala, I, I think Kerala's uh, growth story from 1987 is remittance space. It's a derivative economy. But having said that, Kerala has cumulatively invested with all our, uh, you know, other problems in health and education. And that has changed in a big way. You know, because of our uh, cumulative uh, investment in health, nutrition, and education, the capability of human beings increase. So our people become globally competitive in the global labor market. So the point I'm making is economic GDP growth without human capability will not change, is, will not uh, make sustainable economic uh, change. In Kerala, what happened is Kerala story would have been a very bad story if for the last 35, 40 years, those people from Kerala with the semi-skill education and skill education, the nurses and the ITI, not IIT, uh, change Kerala's uh, economic landscape because our people uh, became globally competitive. So hence, GDP growth as a criteria alone would not help. GDP growth as a criteria also has a big problem, and that is the SDG, you know, Sustainable Development Goals, because it doesn't consider the whole issue of the carbon footprint, the environmental degradation. So it's time for us to have a much more holistic uh, growth model, um, sustainable economic growth model, as different from uh, pure GDP macroeconomic growth, because it can be very deceptive for countries like India. So the next question is also from uh, Shivadasan. Uh, saying that uh, uh, is too much of freedom is bad and uh, how we can actually define uh, what to what level the freedom can be given in a democratic country it's very simple there is something called constitution of india uh, so in the constituent assembly we have very very clearly discussed what kind of freedom is required what kind of fundamental rights are and that is no negotiable. It's not only the constitution of India. There is something called United Nations Charter, which is being negotiated, which also started by, uh, you know, saying that we the people. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948. So you have already a very robust legal framework you know, in India, we have the Constitution of India. Internationally, you have the UN Charter, which, which really clear, uh, you know, clearly says the ethics, the limits, everything of the freedom. And you have the international human rights, you know, instruments and systems, of which the basis is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Civil and Political Rights. So freedom is non-negotiable. And development is... The expansion of freedom for where people have the capability to make strategic choices in terms of their living, in terms of their choices, and in terms of their, you know, habitat. So, in a, you know, freedom always have limitations. Freedom comes with, come with responsibilities. But what happened is those who have power and technology always encroach the freedom and limit our choices and this is not only government government market and even the uncivil society i would say that uncivil society are the society or, or the, those organizations who use identity markers uh, to use that identity against the other to constrain their freedom so hence according to me uh, the already we have in the post second world war uh, and in the post colonial world we have a larger global consensus on for freedom. Freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of association, and freedom of belief. And these freedoms are the basis of all our basic rights. The moment our dignity is compromised, and dignity gets compromised when people are hungry, people are marginalized, people are excluded, people are uh, discriminated on the basis of gender, etc. When these freedoms get discounted, rights get violated. And when the rights get violated, your right to live with dignity get violated. Hence, 
freedom cannot be discounted and i don't think that this this upper middle class notion that it is too much freedom is what created problem actually without freedom india would not have been what is today it is the founding uh, you know independent struggles and the movement and our constitution what made india what it is today with all its you know challenges so hence freedom is not negotiable that's my perspective thank you sir and uh, next i will collate uh, three four questions together regarding kerala and uh, how kerala differentiate from the rest of the world now point number 1 and what is the best way kerala can address the current situation if it is not at properly addressed what can be the suitable model for kerala and how it can be integrated that with the india so i am putting all these three questions together to you sir yeah to begin with uh, kerala i have written a detailed article on eight reasons why kerala is different the first is very paradoxically again our habitat is very unique you know similar habitat is uh, there in sri lanka kerala has a neighborhood dynamics you know the density of population has resulted in a way that we do not have first urban rural divide second you know we are living in a continuum this means you know three things one is we have a neighborhood solidarity kerala is a place where neighborhood is integrated across caste and creed and this density also men historically if you start one school in kerala it had more per capita access than in uh, you know madhya pradesh or even tamil nadu where the distance from one village to another village is 30 km so one of the reasons that kerala moved very fast and similar story is there in uh, you know uh, sri lanka is this access to health and education was relatively easy in my panchayat there are six hospital right uh, you know private government everything and the access is you know very very fast but if it's madhya pradesh your nearest hospital will, will be 50 kilometers or 80 kilometers 30 kilometer depending where are you from so kerala has that advantage the second thing is kerala is a cosmopolitan society where you know trade defined and the uh, you know the cultures across the sea defined our, our our society so different kinds of faith community whether christians or muslims etc came that demographic you know advantage really helped kerala because unlike other hence it was very difficult to segregate too much because of habitat etc the, the other thing is government non government as well as civil society work together to invest in education and health if you look at from 1920s it is um, you know various church organization sn uh, nss sndp mes all of them are involved in education and now health as well along with that government played a proactive role in investing and supporting health and education all of them resulted together to create human capability and also a democratization left parties played a very important uh, of the democratization of the marginalized people in kerala so all these factors gave uh, what kerala today it is not something which is happened in the last 10 years or 5 years it's a cumulative factors now kerala is facing as i said 35000 crores uh, fall my sense is uh, a remittance economy still not exhausted a section of the people are my own sense is while we have around 35000 crores shortfall around 2 lakh crores bank account is there for in the nre alone 2 to 2.5 lakhs crore now what we get is 4% you know i mean because i was also an nri uh, having an nri account very less percentage of in terms of interest growth now with the reserve bank the support if you develop an investment model actually if the treasury can give 8% we can actually look uh, attract much more investment for 3 to 5 years 6 years from our own people so it will be a win win situation those who get 4% or less uh, interest can get a predictable interest with the state guarantee we can raise money the next is we need to completely change the way we think about uh, our uh, you know agriculture there is a huge investment in technology in agriculture 
so that the productivity, the supply chain, and the value chain can be completely transformed from the way we do it. So Kerala can have around, I would say that around 30 parks, we which should be special economic zone uh, with the full protection for what I call it a, a, a network capital uh, list way of looking at it. That is people who are, can have invest from five lakhs to five crore in this, you know, uh, agro parks, uh, techno parks, where there's a production, where there's strategic investment with a business plan, uh, you know, for next 10 years. And with the protection that government interference will be least, it will be enabling. And, you know, other political party intervention in terms of organized power will be also minimalistic. We need to see ways in ways, you know, in, in a society like Kerala, how do we create 20 lakhs employment? And that's the next strategy which we need to send in terms of five years. And that needs a lot of thinking. And I would say that Kerala needs to create a brain trust, um, uh, inviting people from uh, private sector, technology, the civil society. You need a new brain trust to see how Kerala and actually this is also uh, should involve opposition as well as all political parties in Kerala. So you need a unified new vision beyond the uh, you know short-term electoral politics in Kerala, with a view of next 15 years. How do you transform Kerala as an export economy? Now we are export. You know, in the last 30 years we exported people. Now we have to export services and goods of high value, which is which is also environmentally sustainable. So we need to think out of box. And I think technology can be a great leverage. And this is one of the things I would say that Kerala can be a technology destination because our human capability is very high. Our globalized workforce has much exposure than many other states in India. Actually, Kerala can transform. Kerala can take this challenge into a new opportunity. But for that, we need to move beyond narrow electrical electoral politics concern to a larger vision of Kerala, which should be unified. Uh, uh, you know, ensure it should be inclusive, uh, politically inclusive, and sectorally inclusive, and the best of ideas. And I think you need to get the best of young people to think forward rather than people who are 70 or 80 who have a past rather than a future. That's my sense about Kerala. Thank you, sir. That's a very bold statement. Uh, so, uh, one question uh, is that it has been uh, mentioned that the lockdown was announced suddenly without proper planning. But uh, how could have been an, a, a better alternative of that? Uh, what What is a better way of uh, handling this mass migration crisis? No, no, the point about it is, first and foremost, is in India still, we simply do not have a data to know how many migrant workers are there? See, because migrant workers are very seasonal. So if you really look at, and this is more anthropology than usual, you know, your technology tra transferring. People move from village after the, you know, the agriculture season because of the poverty, they move, move, move to the construction sites. They work three months and they return. The problem is that many of these people are what is called informal sector of workers. They do not have any rights. They are being procured by, I will not say they are like foreign laborers. They are being procured with relatively less facility, relatively less protection. Many people die, nobody asks, no other stuff. That needs to change. And I think that was the major problem. The, the assumption of those people who sit in Delhi who didn't know the depth of this issue. And I think that was general. So they needed to map. Actually, they needed to get the map from the states. And, you know, they have at least have an idea. Kerala may have an idea how many non Keralaites work here. The, where are they from? At least Kerala had a better, you know, database. Because of our panchayat also, there is better monitoring. But it's also in many uh, cities like Ahmedabad, Mumbai, it was possible. But unfortunately, 
it's also the elite part of the government they didn't even think about it and if they were given three weeks and special train and a kind of whole system to manage it you actually we should have started this towards the end of uh, february so we were three weeks late if we had a plan and instead of making you know dramatic statement on television saying that we are going to uh, lock down within the next three weeks so whoever wants to travel to their places they can and the government will provide the facilities instead of that one night like demonetization our prime minister came and made a statement that people should live everywhere and he didn't understand many people didn't have a place to live in the labor camp they couldn't live and they didn't have money uh, they didn't have job and they didn't have food where will you know so naturally the only way they knew is to walk for kilometers and kilometers and this has created the callousness of the elite policy thinking and policy ivory tower is not a substitute for to understand what is the reality on the ground so i would say that this this exposed the callousness of those who sit in delhi and take policy it's not only really the political parties including the so called civil servants completely fail the people of india most of the people of india um, thank you sir and uh, next question i am accompanying two three questions together um, where there are lot of survival and app like arogya setu and other apps which are there which is uh, taking our contact and privacy and uh, so what is your thoughts on it and uh, uh, another question is that how Uh, the human rights which is there comparable in a developing country like us or a, a developed country like usa considering the incidents which are happening in us now it is two different questions but the the major issue about privacy and surveillance is to do with your freedom and constraints of freedom that's how i see it you know why we we could no definitely have been when i speak in this thing it is being recorded right this record can be used against me yeah if there is an emergency saying that you said you criticize government and actually in many countries it, it would be so you are under arrest or you are under surveillance so this technology help us to uh, unite us but the recording of this can also constrain my freedom in the future that's the paradox of technology and the problem about it is why government versus the other stuff when we talk about uh, you know when we send something on gmail when we chat on uh, facebook there is no say, I mean, our uh, privacy is already compromised but then what is the problem with arogya setu or when we call about sprinkler etc etc government has a responsibility on the freedom and human rights because state has the monopoly of power in a territory the definition of a nation state is nation state is something which has the monopoly of power and monopoly of legitimate power so they use law and order to impose power in a way which is supposed to protect you and supposed to do service right or a government job is to provide security to citizens and service to citizens but governments always promise freedom and evoke fear and this is the paradox of government every government will say we are here to facilitate freedom freedom from want freedom from fear but actually they use the instruments of fear by using police army etc what we have seen in the us is the fear based on prejudice and prejudice creates exclusion and discrimination prejudice on the basis of gender prejudice on the basis of race caste color so it's not only you know when in the in what happened in the us with the death of george floyd you know it's happening in india on a daily basis unfortunately our people our freedoms you know our a caste driven a religious driven society people are not jumping when dalits are being killed raped when the police murders happened people are being dumped we don't you know and that's one of the reasons in the us because there is an entrenched sense of freedom 
uh, and there is an entrenched movement of people against uh, you know discrimination there was also in the time of covid and actually us is much more uh, uh, worse uh, worsely affected than india people have come out in the street here our televisions don't say it we create what you call a culture of silence and that's where the problem is you know the moment of culture of silence comes culture of silence out of fear in this country is a worrisome thing you know where you have you know whether it is in uh, philippines whether it is in cambodia whether it is in india you know across asia you know go to the uh, bangladesh there are populist authoritarianism whether they create populism, making use of big data, technology, and other things say that my rating is 88%, and who knows, uh, you know, what kind of statistical method you use, uh, how these days big data could be used to create news anywhere. You know, you, you can create news in America, you can create anywhere, you know, using your PR network. And we're saying that, you know, look, I am the most popular guy, and the middle class will say, who are you to question a prime minister or a president with 88% of rating? Now, who gave this 88% of rating? And that's also the problem of technology, right? No, ask the questions. You know, the result comes 88% of So you have populist authoritarianism established through technology and media and communications and primarily use strategic communication to make people confirm so our prime minister asks everybody to clap, we clap. Prime minister asks everybody to dance, we dance. Prime minister asks everybody to like, we do like. This is a communication strategy of power, which makes us to become what you call nice, obedient citizen, and dissent is seen as against the nation. And that is why we need to be extremely worried about the connections between power and technology, and how power uses technology to make people confirm to the system and constrain the freedom. So this is this is why I'm saying that we need to be optimistic about innovative technology, but also we need to be, you know, as Antonio Gramsci said, it's optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. The way it is going on in this country and different parts of Asia, you know, look at Thailand, how many people have been arrested for posting things on on their social media look at uh, you know next door bangladesh so this lockdown has created a big big challenge for freedom and human rights in different parts of the country and we need to be hence be very very vigilant because once the lockdown goes you know people's behavioral change and the way state deal with people would not go uh, that easily so that is my uh, my worry, and hence it's all the more uh, uh, you know important to assert freedom and human rights uh, everywhere. Thank you, sir. Uh, I know that the, the time is a little over than expected. Can we take two more questions if you are available? Um, yeah. So, um, so uh, the question from Bashir is that uh, you said the. Uh, uh, the use of online platform for purchases, teaching, etc., has been increased due to COVID. But India has a large population without literacy that cannot be benefited from this. Would you agree that the major reason for marginalization of the larger session is that India didn't achieve the universal literacy, barring Kerala? See, in Kerala, you have achieved literacy. You know, you can have literacy when people live. In a country where you know there is huge malnutrition, huge infant mortality, maternal mortality, where people don't live up to you know five years, the first I am saying that the most important thing for people is to write to live with dignity and to have enough food. That is the first thing we need to uh, you know do that. Then the education comes literacy. And literacy and education, along with health indicator, create what you call human capability. So in the absence of those things, and this is where we, many of us have been fighting for a whole lifetime, that 490 million people don't have landless, landless levels. And what you call it, migrants, 
who come here and work or other parts of the place work because they don't have a place. They don't have livelihood. So when you are on a struggle for survival, well, the choice is between to live or to, you know, to have literacy. In Kerala, because of, you know, number of Kerala also had famine. But Kerala also have enlightened, uh, you know, uh, rulers, which address, actually, if you know Kerala, grow more food, except, of course, it has environmental uh, issues, grow more food, the introduction of tapioca, the introduction of jackfruit, etc. you know, save Kerala from, you know, severe famine. Hence, Kerala could, because of the access, Kerala could become more literacy, and also we had an earlier advantage. This needs to be done in other states. The good story is places like Tamil Nadu, Himachal Pradesh, you know, places like Goa, parts of, you know, other states, it has shown that health and literacy has changed the economic situation and also created more, uh, you know, technological advantages. So there are positive stories in India. There are many states. Now, really look at it, many states where COVID response relatively better. And these states are uh, have better governance, you know. These states have a bit better health system. And though that's one of the reasons that their response to uh, COVID also has been good. So my reading is literacy is very important. Education is very important. But for that, you need to have people live beyond age five. You need to have people, you know, uh, move out of their struggle for survival. So we need to have a multi pro strategy rather than seeing that, you know, literacy in itself is not uh, going to solve the issue. You know, literacy is good, not good enough. And thank you, sir. And uh, the last question is that, uh, tell us your experiences in UNDP as a mediator. See, United Nations uh, power comes from the power of convening and the power of legitimacy. Uh, the power of legitimacy is United Nations with all its, you know, challenges. That's the only multilateral body available in the world where everybody has a say. Everybody, you know, you can, you have, as you know, the UN General Assembly. And the last three years I have been attending UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, where the government of India say something, I can even as from representing the people, I can say that this is wrong. This is happening. You can have a common fact. So UN is the place where the member states, that is the government, the civil society, academia uh, and the market can come together. So that is one of the major thing about the United Nations. My job in the United Nations was largely, you know, very interesting. It is how do you ensure the government effectiveness, efficiency uh, in terms of governance assessment? Because the problem is assessment is to do with accountability. And the, in a democratic governance assessment was my area of specialization. How do you increase the accountability measures by having a participatory assessment methods? And many, you know, there are interesting examples in Indonesia. There are interesting examples. Actually, there's a very interesting health monitoring assessment system being developed in Mongolia. And actually, Mongolian parliament. There's also a Mongolian parliamentary assessment system developed by the members of the parliament as well as the civil society. So this assessment, and actually in Kerala, partly the people's planning process had an assessment framework. Right in 1996, you know, how do we really, you know, a broad assessment framework. So my job was to ensure, and now also my, my mission in life is democratization of society, democratization of government by increasing accountability. Because a monopoly of power, whether it is in the government or in the uh, private sector, any big company, without accountability can invade your freedom and constrain your life and actually, in a way, make you conform to the structures of power. Um, and hence, you know, the UN, United Nations job was that. And uh, we brought together, you know, one of the major achievements is we created something called uh, Oslo Governance Forum, where we brought people from 
90 countries, uh, you know, all uh, sections of the society and created that a framework for how do you do democratic governance assessment as a means to accountability, participation and transparency, where there is much more democratization of government. And democratization of government is a work in progress. It's not something which stops because, you know, those who are power always accumulate power. And, and that is a default, default system of power, even whether it is democratic or non democratic. Hence, power needs to be always, right, made accountable. And that the, the movement for accountability is, whether it's the right to information in India or others, is an ongoing struggle which needs to be everyday struggle. So politics, uh, beyond political parties and electoral politics, is very important. That is what we call civic politics. And for my job in the UN, was uh, very interesting because it combines civic politics along with governance to increase accountability to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session and uh, it was really enlightening. So, thank you so much. And uh, I'm inviting uh, Dr. Shabarish from CSI for the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Yeah, good evening all. Uh, the, the technological disruptions that normally would have taken two years to happen has already happened in a span of two months, thanks to COVID. And we all know, you know the, the way which we, we interact right now, you know, in the, in the cyberspace through webinars and all this, and uh, it's a testimony to that. So let me, and on behalf of, uh, IEEE Kerala Section, Internet Society of India Trivandrum Chapter, CSI Trivandrum Chapter, PMI Kerala Chapter, IEEE Kerala State Center, Pakkam Maulavi Foundation Trust, IEEE Engineering and Medicine, EMBS Kerala. Uh, I would, I mean, I'll thank Sri John Samuel, President Institute for sustainable development and governance for an enlightening webinar on one of the very relevant topic, technology and economy in the post-COVID era. Sir, you, you had touched uh, on the technological you know, innovations that has uh, I mean, helped in fighting COVID, especially the 3D printing and talked about robotics and also highlighted the the connectivity as one of, the lack of connectivity as one of the challenges in, you know, uh, in, in getting the fruits out of these kind of technologies. So it was, and it was a great uh, talk. And uh, you also highlighted that uh, the governance has an upper hand over technology. And uh, you highlighted the case of Kerala and how the Kerala fought the COVID. So uh with it, these words you know it was really you know inspiring and uh, i think uh, uh, it talks on uh, the economy as well the economy how it is going to get impacted and what is the what are the probable solutions were also touched upon and we are really delighted to have you with us for this webinar and uh, i would like to extend a more round of thanks and applause for a great webinar like this and secondly, I would like to thank the audience. I think it's over 200 plus people who are already, I mean, uh, in, in watching the webinar. So thanks a lot. And I think uh, it was a great time together. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shabrish. That was uh, really wonderful. So. Uh, we will be continuing doing the webinars in the, in the coming session, uh, Wednesdays as well. And uh, there will be a series of webinars which are lined up. So uh, we will be uh, providing uh, international speakers from everywhere and uh, uh, expecting your participation in these webinars. Thank you all for this great participation and uh, continuous support in these webinars. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So let's close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
ಹರೀಂದ್ರಲಾಲ್ ಎನಿ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಟು ಆಡ್ ಸೋ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್